We are FBC Summit, leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known. Thank you so much for joining us today. Here's our pastor, Dr. Larry LeBlanc. Several months ago, I bought a small air compressor for my home because it seems like every time I turn around, something at the house needs air. Every time I check a trailer tire, it needs air. Every time I check a bicycle tire, it seems like it needs air. It seems like if you checked your car tires right now, I'm guessing probably some of your car tires need air. There's a basketball in the yard right now that I can bet you if we left right now and went and looked at it, it probably needs air. Something is constantly needing to be blown up or inflated at our house. And I got to thinking the other day, I'm sitting there airing up a basketball, and as I'm airing up that basketball, I had a thought. Where did the air go? Nobody's lit the air out of the bicycle tires. Nobody, I don't think, has come to my trailer tires and, and lit the air out of the trailer tires. No one has intentionally flattened the kids' bicycle tires. So where does the air go? There doesn't seem to be a hole in any of these things. They're not punctured. But yet every time when you check it, it seems like there's a slow leak. Now, the problem with that is if you go to use any of these items without airing up the tire, without airing up the basketball, it's going to be incredibly difficult to try to do anything with that. If you've ever pulled a trailer that was low on air on the tires, you know it feels like you're pulling twice as much weight. If you've ever tried to play basketball with a basketball that only had half the amount of air, if you've ever tried to ride a bicycle with low air pressure in the tires, you know just how difficult it makes it. And one thing that I have found is that a lot of times our lives are a lot, a lot, a lot like the things that need air at the house. We don't really know where the air is gone, but sometimes over time, it feels like it's leaked out somewhere. And when we're trying to live our lives, sometimes it feels like we're pulling extra weight, like there's just not quite enough bounce. And we find ourselves asking the question, where did the air go? It seems like it hasn't been that long ago that I was on top, like that long ago I was feeling good, that long ago that I had energy, that long ago that I was excited, that long ago that I was ambitious, that long ago that I was motivated, but something happened. Has it ever felt like to any of you that the air has just been let out? Have you ever realized one day that things just seem like they're harder than they ought to be. It seems like there may be a fog over your mind. You feel down in your spirit, and maybe or maybe not, you just can't really put a finger on it. As we open up this morning to 1 Kings chapter 19, we find Elijah in a place where all the air has been let out. He's in a place that we haven't seen him yet in all of our studies so far, and it's a disturbing place to find such a man of God. Now, if you haven't been with us, that's okay. Let me, let me get you up to date. Just recently in Elijah's life, he's performed one of the quintessential miracles or been a part of one of the most quintessential miracles in all of the Old Testament. He's challenged Jezebel and Ahab to have all the Baal and Asherah prophets brought to Mount Car Carmel. They've had this showdown on Carmel to find out whether Baal was God or whether Yahweh was God. Yahweh won in convincing fashion. You'll remember the fire fell down from heaven. And then following that event, you can remember that, that even the prophets of Baal were seized and they were killed and a good many of the people had fallen down on their face and they had confessed that great confession, the Lord, he is God. Yet following this event, what we also know that Ahab was released off the mountain and he went and told his wicked wife about everything that had happened. But of all the people that repented in Israel, there was one lady who refused to repent. And I think we could have guessed this by now because her name was Jezebel. And she made a vow, she made an oath that if it was the last thing she did, she was going to make sure that Elijah was killed for what he had done. And Elijah, hearing this news, heads out and runs as far as a man could run to get away from it all because all of a sudden the air has been let out. If there ever was a literal time 
where someone had gone from the mountain to the valley. You're going to read it here. And my prayer for you this week as we study this passage together is that the Lord will show you that it is highly possible for a real Christian to become depressed. And we've got to know how in our darkest hours, how the Lord responds to our struggle. Let's discover that together as we stand and read the Word of God. 1 Kings chapter 19, we begin in verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. And Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. And he came to a broom tree sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And he laid down under the tree and fell asleep. And all at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. And he looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate and drank, and then he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and strengthened by that food, he traveled forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night. Lord, would you please teach us today that even servants of yours, Christians, that, Lord, sometimes the air does get let out that we can become discouraged, that we can become depressed. And God, we must know how in our darkest moments, in our weakest days, that not only do we have a God that meets us there, but we have a God that responds to us there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please be seated? One of the things I am so thankful for in Scripture is that God does not sugarcoat the faults of his people that follow him. Throughout Scripture, if you start in Genesis and read to Revelation, it is a lot of men and women of God that are highly used, but there are also men and women of God that have issues, that have struggles, that have problems, that deal sometimes with fears and anxiety and discouragement and depression. And when we read the Bible, we don't come away saying, well, there's no one there I can identify with because everyone in the Bible was perfect. No, in fact, just the opposite. We find people just like Elijah, and we say, well, maybe there's hope for me because even even people who were devout, strong followers of the Lord found themselves under broom trees at some point in their life. You see, Elijah found himself in a place that you would not have expected to find him. He finds himself alone in the wilderness under a broom tree, completely overwhelmed in fear and discouraged. And it's in these times that we figure out that Christianity is not always about the mountaintops. Thank God he gives us those. But sometimes it's about the valleys, and sometimes it's about the struggle, and sometimes it's about the difficulty. And you need to know that even in the darkest moments, not only do you have a God who is there with you, not only do you have a God who understands, but in spite of the greatest difficulties in your life, you have a God who loves you and speaks encouragement into your life, and that's what we see this morning. So I want us to study this together, and, and number one, number one, if you're taking notes this morning, feelings of depression and discouragement are not abnormal for Christians. They are not abnormal for Christians. There seems to be a, an idea that floats out there that somehow if you're saved, you wouldn't ever get discouraged, or you might not ever get depressed. You might not ever deal with that. Well, friends, let's be honest. Life throws stuff at us, and in an ideal world, our emotions may not be affected, but to be honest, that's impossible. Our emotions are uh, connected to our spirituality. Our spirituality is often connected to our physical health, and so because of those things, we can get brought into places where at times, not only do we feel depressed or discouraged, but how many of you have ever dealt with this? Not only have you felt discouraged, 
Not only have you felt depressed, but then you have felt guilty about feeling depressed and discouraged because you thought, well, I'm saved. I shouldn't have these thoughts. I shouldn't have these problems. Maybe if I loved Jesus more, I wouldn't be struggling with this. Maybe if I prayed more, I wouldn't have this problem. Maybe if I read my Bible more. I mean, it seems like a lot of the people that I know that are Christians don't deal with the same things that I'm dealing with. So maybe because I'm dealing with it, that means that somehow I'm not connected to the Lord and that is a thought that is straight from the devil himself and you need to know this morning that you can love Jesus with your whole heart and still fall into dark places and have difficulty and struggle and so as we look through this we know that Elijah in this story all the way up into 19 1 has been a great man of faith a man who has suffered greatly and been through so much and yet here we find, find him not only depressed, he's suicidal. He is so depressed, he asked the Lord to kill him. Did you, did you see that there? I, I don't want you to miss that. That's about as deep down a hole as an individual can get. God, he says this, and I'm so glad it's phrased just like this. Lord, I've had enough. How many of you that are here this morning have ever had a time in your life where you've just said, I've had enough? I've absolutely had enough. Or maybe you've said it like this God, I can't take it anymore. I, 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 can't, I can't do this. I, I, I can't keep going like this. God, help me. I'm at the end of my rope. That's where Elijah was, and he pours this out before the Lord. He had gone as far as a human being could go. He had gone south all the way to the bottom of the country. He had gone all the way to Beersheba, left his, left his servant there, and gone on into the wilderness, past 90 miles, and he finds a tree all by itself while he's all by himself, and he's gone to the uttermost limits of the land, and from there he's gone into the wilderness. He's gone into a place that is away and isolated. And he's come to a place where runners often call it hitting the wall. Now, if you've ever attempted long distance running, maybe you know what that phrase is. But at some point, whether it's running, maybe it is um, even with, with working out, you, you reach a place where you are hitting the wall and you think there is nothing left. You, the muscles are tensed up. You feel dehydrated. You don't feel like you have the lung capacity to go any further. You can't push one more pound of weight. You can't do one more rep. And often they will tell you that if you run through that, that you have to just keep going. You have to run through the wall. You have to lift through the wall to get to the other side of it. But Elijah's at the place where he has absolutely hit, hit the wall. So I, I ask myself the question, is Elijah alone in men of God that have felt this way? Is he an outlier example? Because if he was, and he's the only biblical example we could have of somebody that had dealt with this, maybe we, we don't isolate this problem, and maybe we, we just diagnose Elijah with something, and maybe we say he's got some kind of chemical imbalance, or maybe we even say he just was off, or, or he wasn't loving the Lord enough, or he wasn't studied up enough, or prayed up enough, or all of those things, and maybe that's where the category we place him. But if you're going to place him there, then, then let me tell you other people that got so depressed that they wanted to die in Scripture. Job. What was Job called? A man after, uh, he was a man who was blameless and upright. That's what the Lord said about Job to Satan. He said, he's my man. And yet he got to a place where he said he despaired of life. That he wished he had never been born. That's exactly what Job said about himself. Well, well, Larry, that's just Job and Elijah. Is there anybody else? Moses. 
Moses got to a place in his life where he wished he had never been the leader of Israel, where he despised of the people, where he hated the leadership, and he wished that God would take him out as well. Jonah, prophet of God, sees a great revival and goes and finds himself under a vine tree asking the Lord to kill him and more depressed over the lack of the vine covering his head when God killed it than he did about anything else in his life. We see that in Jonah's life. But it, it's, not just, it's not just them. Jeremiah, we find it in his life. He was so down and so depressed over the prophecies that he was having to give that he became overwhelmed and he despaired of life. You say, well, will there any New Testament examples? Yes, the Apostle Paul. Even the Apostle Paul came to a point where he said, I despair even of life itself. Because the ministry had gotten so overwhelming, there were threats on his life. He got tired of prison. He got to the point where he knew he had to keep going for the glory of God. But he got to the point where he was so okay with death because he knew what it was going to bring. And he wanted out of all of the pressure that he had on him all the time. Even people like John the Baptist. What did Jesus say about John the Baptist? Among women, there has never been a greater person born than John the Baptist. Now, that's a compliment. I can't think of a greater compliment than anyone's ever given anyone. Yet, we know of John the Baptist that he even got to a point. Matthew chapter 11, verse 3. He actually sent a message to Jesus because he was so down and so discouraged. He said, would you just go ask him and make sure he's the Messiah? He had spent his whole life declaring, look, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he got so down at one point that he had to go to Jesus and say, look, just, just tell me one more time. I, I, I just, I need to hear it from you one more time. I, I, I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to preach for you. I'm willing to go ahead of you. But, but I'm in a place that is so dark that I need you to reassure me. That's John the Baptist. You hear me quote, Charles Haddon Spurgeon from this pulpit quite a bit. I think he's the greatest preacher in my mind that ever walked the earth, ex excluding obvious biblical examples. What a lot of people don't know about Charles Haddon Spurgeon is for the entirety of his ministry, he dealt with severe bouts of depression. They came on him and he called it a case of melancholy. And sometimes it would so overwhelm him, he had trouble getting out from under it. There's a, a hymn that is one of my fa favorites. There is a fountain filled with blood flowing from Emmanuel's veins. It was written by a man by the name of William Cowper. William Cowper was at a point where he was so suicidal that probably if it hadn't been for John Newton coming into his life and inviting him to come live with him and to write hymns so that the church could develop a hymn book, William Cowper may have never written There Is a Fountain because he struggled to the end of his days with serious discouragement, serious doubt, what we would call today depression. Some of you may be battling some things right now. Now, I want you to know that this isn't about a clinical diagnosis that I'm talking about today. There are some people that deal with it on an everyday extreme, day in, day out problem that, that seems to always persist. But what I want us to focus on truly this morning is those situations, but the fact that every one of us in here will find ourselves under a broom tree at some point. Every one of you is going to find yourself in a place that's dark, where you're disillusioned, where you're discouraged, where you're despairing, where you don't know what to do, where you feel all alone, where you, you wish that things were different, where you feel like, if you're honest, that God should have worked things out a little bit differently than they did. I'm telling you that if you've lived any length of time, you have looked for a broom tree. You've looked for that place where you're all alone and you're finding that you are at the depths of what you can handle and you've cried out to God but we need to know if that's true the, the second thing that we want to point out from Elijah's life today first of all we see in his life that feelings of de de depression and discouragement are not abnormal for Christians but number two 
Certain events make us more susceptible to discouragement and depression. Certain events make us more susceptible to discouragement and depression. Would it be fair to say that Elijah, I want you to think about his life, and then I want you to to think about some of these descriptors, and then I want you to think with me about your life, and maybe at times when you have felt this way, if any of these descriptors also describe you. Would it be fair that in this moment that Eli- to say that Elijah felt overwhelmed? Would it be fair to say that Elijah felt panic-stricken? Would it be fair to say that Elijah felt threatened? Would it be fair to say that Elijah felt exhausted, physically, emotionally, spiritually exhausted? Would it be fair to say that Elijah was confused? I think so. At one moment, he's running for his life, and in the next moment, he's asking to die. Would it be fair to say that he was illogical? He had gotten to his place where He wasn't even really focusing on some of the things that he should have been focusing on around him. Would it be fair to say that Elijah had gotten caught off guard? Now, when I say caught off guard, what do I mean? He didn't think it was going to go down like this. He couldn't have imagined that after what God did and the people crying, the Lord, he is God, that that there wouldn't be a massive revival, that even Jezebel herself wouldn't turn. But that's not what happened. So, When he comes down off the mountain, what he discovers is not how he thought God was going to operate. Have any of you ever found yourself in a place where you thought, well, this isn't what I thought God was going to do? This isn't how I thought he should have worked it out? This this isn't where I thought we were going? This isn't how I had this planned? And Elijah finds himself in a moment being so caught off guard. So because of that, I think it would also be fair to say that he was vulnerable that he had obviously been criticized, that he was lonely, that he was lost in self-pity. He says, I'm no better than my father's. What does that mean? It simply means this. I thought for a while I was going to make a real difference. Now I'm looking around and nothing's going to change. Nothing's changing. I I thought there was going to be some real change, but I've done all of this, and I'm no better than my father's. We haven't made any inroads. He feels like a failure. That's what he's saying to the Lord. I I feel like a failure in my life. You see, friends, sometimes we end up setting ourselves up to feel like a failure because we go into things with unrealistic expectations. We set ourselves up because we've placed ourselves and we expect so much that there's no way we could have ever met those expectations. And then when we, when we don't, we find ourselves discouraged. We find ourselves depressed. Another thing that I think we have to be very careful of is one of the times when you are most susceptible to discouragement and depression is not just during the times that it's very low in your life, those obvious times of death and loss and grief and sorrow, those are a little more obvious. But where often we are so susceptible to depression and discouragement is after great victories in our life. There's not a greater victory that Elijah would ever have in his life than on Mount Carmel. There's not a victory that any of us would ever have. I don't think that would be that incredible. And so after the victory, a lot of times we think that it's after the victories that people's lives, they must be so excited, so satisfied, they finally reached their goal that now their life can be happy. But often we find the exact opposite, the exact opposite. Some of you may have seen the documentary the weight of gold effect. It's a documentary on Michael Phelps. And it talks about not only Phelps, but many other decorated Olympians, gold medal Olympians. And Phelps is so raw and honest when he talks about it. He said, my whole life, all I ever did was swim. It was all I did. It was all I was dedicated to. I didn't have any other activities. I was dedicated to that. And while I was swimming, I had this goal. I had this purpose. I had this drive. While I was winning medals, it was satisfied. After I broke having more gold medals than anyone else in Olympic history, it was satisfied. But then that day came, and I'd 
achieved it all and the Olympics were over for me and I look back at my life and I don't know who I am anymore because all I've ever been is a swimmer. And we find oftentimes with people that when they achieve not what, when they achieve what they want, what they thought was going to satisfy, they find themselves in the dead of night asking a question. Is this all there is? Is this it? We've seen Super Bowl champions and NBA MVPs express the exact same thing. Sometimes it's not about not getting what you want. It's about the fact that you got what you always wanted. And now that you're there, you realize that God really did create a hole in our hearts that only he can satisfy. So it's not just in your darkest moments that we need to be careful. It may be on our highest mountaintops that we realize that there's a valley below. There are certain people that are especially vulnerable. People that are type A, ambitious. They need achievement. They need validation. That sets us up. But there's also a group that I need to speak to very briefly this morning. And if you're in leadership of any kind, you are especially vulnerable. When we're in leadership... Often it is that if the leader can be taken out, however that is, then because of that, when the leader is taken out, then and only then is it that the organization begins to crumble. So Satan often attacks people that are in leadership because Satan's goal is to break and destroy. 1 Peter 5, 8, he is roaming around like a roaring lion seeking to devour, to kill, and destroy. He doesn't play fair, and often Satan attacks you when you are already down. Now, I would tell you that of the tools that Satan has in his garage that he is able to use, especially on Christians, that I believe that one of the greatest tools that Satan has that he would refuse to sell if he had a garage sale is the tool of discouragement and the tool of depression. Because if he can get people to live there and stay there, he can render them ineffective. And here's what is so horrible. I want to go back to something that, that we mentioned a little earlier. Not only does he take that and often grab people by the neck, but then he has them for forever because now that he has them with depression, he also has them with guilt. Now, here to, here's what we were talking about earlier. You mean you feel depressed? Why do you feel depressed? Are you not satisfied in Jesus? Are your sins not forgiven? Now, don't you feel guilty? Everything that God has blessed you with, and look how it is that you feel. What thanks do you give him? You mean you go to that church and you sing those songs and act like it's okay, but deep inside your heart you know that you are ransacked with anxiety and you are ransacked with depression and you are ransacked with discouragement. Maybe it is that you really don't know Jesus after all because if you did know Jesus, do you really think that you'd have all that going on in your life? I mean, after all, doesn't the Bible say that he would set you free? You don't look set free. You don't feel set free. So maybe it is that you ought to just quit while you're ahead because really what you've go, got going on in your life is a complete disappointment and you can keep up the facades and the smiles and you can keep acting like you're saved but really even if everybody else doesn't know I know and you know exactly what you are friends that is the lie from the pit of Satan that reverberates in people's heart because if he can get you to a place where not only you're depressed and discouraged, but you're guilty over being depressed and discouraged, then all of a sudden he owns you. And friends, I'm telling you that you do not allow him to own you. You do not allow that voice to continually speak into your life. You come back to the Word of God. And I'm not telling you that it is okay to always be depressed. That's not what I'm communicating with you. But what I am communicating with you is because you deal with that, Part of the reason you're convicted is because you're battling. And if you're battling, it means you haven't given up. If you care, it's because you haven't given in. If you know there's an alternative, it's because God has placed it there. If you have any hope at all, it's because you know who Jesus is. And even in the midst of it, one of the beautiful things about this is that even though these events make us more susceptible and discouraged, 
Number three, the Lord meets us and provides for us in our darkest hours. The Lord meets us and provides for us in our darkest hours. There are a lot of things that we can learn under a broom tree. A lot of things that we can learn. I want to just quickly go through a list of things that you might learn under the broom tree. An old Greek proverb says, you will break the bow if you keep it always bent. Even Jesus himself, and he was perfect, had to get away from crowds of people. He had to find time for rest. He had to find time to be able to renew and reinvigorate his life. You notice that that in this passage that God allowed Elijah a time of rest. He fed him. He let him take naps. He gave him something to eat and then let him go back to bed. He let Elijah have some time. He doesn't step into Elijah's life and say, get up, you no good for nothing, low life piece of trash. Get up. You have no reason to feel this way. You know what I did for you in Zarephath. You remember what I did for you in Kareth. You remember how I provided for you. You have no reason to just sit there and whine. Nope. The Lord meets him where he is and provides for him where he is. And in doing so, he allowed Elijah to pour his heart out honestly before him. Where Elijah's ahead of so many of us is he wasn't scared to pray what was really going on in his heart. See, a lot of us, we feel that way, but we won't vocalize it to God because we think somehow we can't. Which is really the height of foolishness because God already knows what you're thinking. He God already knows what you're feeling. So sometimes when you're in a dark place, it's that you go honestly before him. And I don't believe that Elijah ever gets better if he, he doesn't have these cathartic moments with the Lord. I don't believe a lot of you in here are ever going to get better if your prayer life doesn't get more real, if it doesn't get more honest, if it doesn't get more raw, that you've got to learn to tell him what's really on your heart and what's really bothering you, and you begin to deal with it. Oftentimes, people are looking for a therapist, and there's nothing wrong with a a therapist. But let me tell you, friends, we have one who's already been called Wonderful counselor. It means that he wants to hear honestly from our heart and allow us to pour out before him. Number three, when we think about these ways that the Lord meets us, he allowed Elijah not only to pour out his heart honestly, but he reminds Elijah that God is not through with him yet. I love this. Eat a little something, take a nap. Eat a little something, take a nap. Then he finally gets up and he starts telling him, you've got to get up. There's a journey ahead of you. Your job is not done. Now, I'm going to tell you what I think is the worst sound in the world. I'm absolutely confident of this. The worst sound in the world is an alarm clock. Awful. Awful. I don't care what sound tone you set it to. It doesn't matter. It's awful. And then when Elijah wakes up, both times he is woken up by the Lord. He's allowed to rest, but then he's woken up. And sometimes we get woken up by the Lord to say, okay, you've had some time. You may not be feeling better yet, but you have to get up because I'm not done with you yet. Elijah says, kill me. God says, I don't want to. That's, I'm not ready. So incredible. I I don't want to jump ahead in this series, but God's actually never going to let him die. If you hadn't read the rest of the story, keep reading. He not only doesn't answer the prayer there, he doesn't ever answer the prayer. He takes him up. So God is not finished with him yet, so he prepares for what's still in front of us. He took care of him, showing him that he was still loved. He warns Elijah. It's not like Elijah doesn't already know, but he needs to be reminded that it's not going to be easy. John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble. Meaning that God may not remove the burden, but he will supply fresh grace. You need to hear that. God may not remove the burden. He may not take away what's causing discouragement or depression, but he will give you enough grace to meet the need where you are. God reminds us that we are not victims of our circumstances. He lifts Elijah up and says, you are not a victim here. You can't always have a victim mentality. 
And then he promises that he will always be with him. He will be with him like he was with Daniel in the lion's den. He will be with him like he was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. He will be with him like he was with Paul and Silas as they sang in prison. And he reminds Elijah that his fear needs to be redirected. He is scared to death of Jezebel when really the only one he needs to fear is God. And when you fear God, the fear of man dissipates. He also reminds us that even when the load is too much, it's not too much for the Lord. He will not allow you to be tempted more than what you can bear. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So friends, I come before you today to just give you a reminder. And if you had to boil this down, it'd just be really this. I don't want any of you to ever have a bad, have a bad day. I mean, I don't. If I could keep you, every one of you, from ever being down. If somehow I had that ability, I would try to do that for you. But that's not a reality, and I don't. So because of that, we're all going to be real this morning and just say, you know what, sometimes it's going to be tough, and sometimes it's going to be real tough, right? Sometimes it's going to be the kind of struggle we studied this morning. But Hebrews 4 makes it very clear. We do not have a high priest that does not sympathize with us but he knows every pain and every weakness because he has experienced everything that you have ever experienced. And that's the God that you come to. That's the God that you trust. That's the God that you trust on the top of Mount Carmel, and that's the God that you trust under the broom tree in Beersheba. So friends, today I want to invite you that we're a church, and, and I've, I've told you this hundreds of times, but we're a church that just likes to be real, and we're filled with real people people that love Jesus, people that are doing the best they can to serve him with their whole heart, but people with problems, right? People with issues, people with discouragements and depressions and anxieties and all the things that go with that. Thank God he does take us just as we are. Thank God we can come to him and we can be real and we can be honest. And thank God that even when we're under the broom tree, we have a God that meets us there. Maybe you need your God to meet you there this morning. If you've wondered, am I sure that God will meet me there? Am I sure? How would you ever believe that God would go to a cross for you, yet wouldn't meet you where you are right now? He'll meet you. He will meet you right where you are, right here, right now. Would you stand with me?